We're gonna, we're gonna chill, yeah. Yeah. yeah okay. We're, 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 yes. 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 All right. <laughs> I'm good at making friends. Give me a phone. I love this. Do you know who this is? Yes. Yeah, it's, it's, it's Spotify, so it's Paul to open. Paul to open. Yes. And what do you do? Info dump and busk. Freestyle. Boom. A gathering. You're all here. Could be fun. And one in addition. <laughs> this time there's three of us. Oh, stop busking. Knock on wood. Do what I can. Hello, and welcome to Pull to Open, an ongoing quest to watch every single episode of the entire television program, Doctor Who, in random order. I'm Pete Paschal. And I'm Chris Taylor. And uh, Pete, knock, knock. <laughs> Who's there? <laughs> it's our very special guest for our very special episode of Pull to Open, journalist and broadcaster, as they used to say in the old days, Brian Young. Welcome, hey, to Brian. Pull to Open, oh, thank Brian. you, uh, thank you for Brian, having me. Thank you for coming on, Brian. I know from my uh, other life as a uh, Star Wars guy, and uh, he he and I have had many many discussions over the years. We've shown up at many uh, premieres. Uh, I've been on the the Full of Sith podcast. Followed that from its initiation, and uh, Brian, you've done roughly six hundred pulls. Full, fools of Sith, pulls of Sith? <laughs> yeah, something like that. Full we've we've, we've been we combine the podcasts. Yes, yeah, we've uh, we've been uh, podcasting on Full of Sith since uh, for for ten years now, um, oh. almost ten and a half, I think. So, yeah, yeah I think we've got over six hundred releases on our feed, and uh, you're part of at least a dozen of them. I yes, I I gotta I gotta get back on. We gotta get back into Star Wars yeah. mode. But but today we're in Doctor Who mode, and uh, you have done something. Uh, you know, uh, uh, Pete and I, are journalists who've, who've written about Doctor Who in the past. Um, but you've done a little bit more than than just writing about. It. You've been part of the the licensed content of yeah enterprises. Uh, tell us about that. Yeah. Yeah, so uh, the Rittenhouse Archive, which is a, ma- you know, a, a manufacturer of trading cards, has picked up the Doctor Who license to do those trading cards, and I'm writing all of them. So uh, yes. as far as has been released so far, uh, season 11 and 12 with Jodie Whittaker, uh, and the uh, – Christopher Eccleston and David Tennant years. And I've worked on some more, uh, beyond that. Uh, and they're really fun and they're, they're a much different challenge. I write a lot of star Wars trading cards too. And those are a little easier where they just kind of give you a title and maybe a movie reference or a character or whatever. And I can just write that out. But with the doctor who cards, it's really fascinating where they say, we just want three, three cards for every episode. Uh, or six in the case of the specials, and you need to, or me, I mean, no one's doing this but me, um, <laughs> summarize it in three 100-word chunks to make three cards, or six 100-word chunks for the specials. And it's taught me so much about storytelling and how to condense things, because you want to get the big sweep of each of the episodes on each card. And I have a, a huge fondness for the trading cards as well. Um that was like when I was a kid, that was one of the only things I could afford when I was collecting stuff. Um, so I started by collecting star Wars trading cards and Batman trading cards and Ninja turtles and that sort of thing. And so, um, back then in the eighties, that was a really key way to like interact with the, the stories and learn more details and things like that. So I've been trying to, as I go through it, not just summarize, but add detail that maybe might not have been spoken in the episode or things like that. So that people reading the cards might learn something extra about, about Dr. Who or star Wars or whatever mm-hmm. else I'm working on. You know, it's, it's funny you um, knowing that you're kind of a star Wars guy, because uh, as I was growing up in the eighties, the trading card, you, what you were just saying there about sort of having that avenue to interact with it, I, it resonates so much with it. I remember those Return of the Jedi trading cards you could get 
uh, especially. And and you could like it came with like bubble gum or whatever. And uh, but like I, I growing up in Canada, like there was I think an expectation that I was supposed to be into hockey cards, which I kind of was a little bit. But when when Star Wars cards came out, I was like, oh yeah, baby, like this is this is my thing. Um, yeah. It's really cool to hear that. Like that's sort of ongoing, and like now even more generations can do it. Even though I don't think they could get it at their local. Uh, convenience store like i used to anymore. yeah no the market for trading cards is definitely very different from when i was a kid and that was a really interesting world to step into um especially with the way they package them now and it's it it's the same across doctor who and it's a, the same across star wars and everything is that there's chase cards right so you'll have your base set of cards and then you'll have like a version with a different color or a gold foil stamp on it or something. And there's only 25 of those cards or mm. autograph cards, right? Actually, I bought a few boxes of the Doctor Who cards I got uh, that I wrote. And actually, I was really fortunate enough to pull a Jodie Whitt- Whittaker autograph out of it. Uh, so there's nice. all kinds of really cool stuff in them. And it sort of changed the economics of them. So they're so much more expensive than they were. Uh, mm. But uh, I mean, I was used to paying like 50 cents for a pack in a, in a used bookstore. Right. Sure. So now paying a hundred buck, paying a hundred bucks for a box of, uh, you know, 20 packs or whatever it is, is astronomical in my view, but is there a dream, it's worth card, it. a dream card for you to work on within Dr. Who that you haven't yet? Like um, or maybe or something like that, you know, I'm a huge Matt Smith fan Mm. and getting to do all of his stuff was really fun. Um, And I got to, I got to do the episodes for the 50th anniversary special. And those were really, um, those were really fun to work on. Um, I really, I hope that I'll get a chance to go back and do a lot of the classic stuff. My Mm. connection with the classic stuff was like, Oh, it's way too late. I'm up past my bedtime and, and PBS BBC BBC is on now. Um, and I would love a reason to go back and sort of be forced to go through all of those episodes, um, in the best way possible. Um, I love them, but I just, I haven't watched them as encyclopedically as I have the newer stuff, which, um, I, I've really enjoyed, yeah, if you if you had six cards for a classic story, I think five of them would be running through corridors, basically. Yeah. yeah. So, no, yeah, I, it's a, interesting. A corridor would be a card in every set. Yes. It's interesting <laughs> to think about how how that might be broken up. It might be more something like two cards per episode, and then you'd get probably you know eight cards for a for a whole arc or. 10 cards right. or depending on how long the arc is. I wonder how they, how they do that. That's all up to the whims of the, the BBC mm. and the licensor and, and whoever else. Mm. And I'm just sort of the, the guy they call in to, to do the breakdowns, but it would right. be an interesting challenge. You know, Marty, imagine the, the uh, getting the, the the full set for Trial of a Time Lord would be insane. Oh my God. Yeah. 50 oh cards, God. the special foil pack. <laughs> For each each single yeah. episode here, oh man! And then Good the stuff, Mel right? card just appears randomly in every deck, and nobody knows how <laughs> it got there. Um, yes, little trial of a time lord joke. Well, uh, speaking of forcing functions that that force us to go through the entire classic series, that's kind of what we've been doing here on on pull to open, uh, yeah. doing a lot of stuff that is new to me. Uh, and uh, yeah, let's let's uh, let's take it back Pete if you will with the uh, the previously on uh, and tell us about the the classic series episodes that we were exiled to absolutely so first of all guys yes we are going to um <laughs> well go, going to have a commentary about an episode here uh, it's coming up and just to set that up previously on pull to open we have been in space a lot first a, lot, a, a lot. few a few episodes ago we were at the ark in space a uh, very well regarded episode of the tom baker era where the weirin nearly took over all of humanity but believe it or not the doctor did stop them uh yes, and once uh, we were there, were, there of, were bugs there were bugs in that episode bugs, just gonna point that out scary bugs possible foreshadowing big bugs too um and we flee we fled the bugs ended up in another era of the future 
uh, in a little adventure called Frontier in Space in the John Pertwee era, where we got to see the early Earth Empire and how the master was manipulating it to get, go to war with another empire. But then there was a third empire that was going to take over. And go ahead and listen to that podcast to get the spoiler on that. I won't do it again here. <laughs> yes. um, spoiler alert on a 50-year-old show. Yes, but again, we, the, the randomizer has been obsessed with the future lately because after Frontier in Space, it took us to the mutants. An earlier adventure in the Third Doctor Adventures, but later in the Earth Empire was the decline of that empire. And we got to see mutants on a weird space colony and uh at the end of that one yeah chris actually I, I, asked the I'll randomizer also say, by the way yep. mutants turning into butterflies that could also be seen as bugs yeah they were very bug like yeah. they had mandibles weird claws yeah. etc yeah yeah that's true um but i remember at the end of that podcast chris you had asked the randomizer <laughs> to take us to the randomizer's favorite doctor and man did it deliver because of course it took us immediately to an adventure involving Peter Capaldi, the 12th doctor. And it is series 10 episode four. Knock, knock. Knock, knock. Indeed. Kind of surprising that we haven't, uh, you know what? I, I, it wasn't until we did this story that I realized the inherent joke in the title, knock, knock. Um, <laughs> Really? It took you this one? Well, I'm glad we, it, it, took, least, it took me until it, a second viewing many years later uh, from 2017, which is when this is on, when I saw it the first time to like, oh, yeah, oh, the next line is who's there. Oh, I get it. Okay. Um, but yeah, yeah, the randomizer loves Capaldi. The randomizer especially loves Capaldi's Series 10. Mm -hmm. uh, because Who we doesn't have, love Series we've 10? We've done though. Smile. Uh, which had connections to the Ark in space. We've done Oxygen, uh, which is one after this. Uh, Pyramid at the End of the World, Lie of the Land, that was an early one. And The Eaters of Light. I mean, it, mm -hmm. it's possible that uh, Season 10 may, may be our first season bingo. Could be, could be. We need a few more in there. We need uh, the pilot. Yeah. We need uh, some stuff with uh, Masters later on. Um, yeah. But yes, Series 10, it's yeah. a popular one. Yeah, Especially so just before we, we jump into the uh, feedback loop, uh, Brian, is this was this one you watched at, at the time? Were you were you on board with with Capaldi at, at the at the time, or you're catching up now? So, um, I'll be honest. Like, this is the first episode of season ten I've watched. I watched Capaldi's first two seasons, and then uh, whatever was happening with my cable, kind of like I didn't know where to find it. And then I picked back up with Jodie Whittaker. So this is like this weird hole uh, in my oh, wow. in my Doctor Who that I haven't picked up yet. <clears throat> and um, I reached. I was showing um, Valkyrie, my my youngest kid, Doctor Who, and we were taking her through it. And we got to Capaldi, and she sort of just checked out. Mm. And this was about a year ago. So we got like three episodes into his new run and I was like, I was planning to catch up then. And then she checked out, but she watched this with me for this. And she was like, why didn't we finish this? And I was like, that is an excellent question. So this episode was good enough uh, for an eight year old to go. Actually, I think I've misjudged Capaldi. Oh, nice. not in those words, but generally. That is That's so really cool. awesome. As regular listeners know, we do have a regular segment where where Pete talks about his kids uh, viewing Doctor Who. So we'll we'll definitely get to the uh, the childhood view on Knock Knock, a very deliberately scary watch it behind the sofa kind of story. Hmm. Um, but yeah, we'll get there first. Yeah. Pete, well, let me just first brunch. of all say, no, go ahead. You did. Under <laughs> the feedback loop. It's, uh, but well, also, before we plunge into the show notes. Yeah, that's right. That's his go. Yeah. Before we go to the feedback loop, I know we're a little late on this, guys, uh, to give you the notice, but if you're just here for the commentary on Knock Knock, go ahead and check the show notes for the time code on when that commentary begins. Sorry we didn't get the reminder in earlier. Um, but for those who are listening now, let's go right into the feedback loop. All right. Well, got listeners. As you know, one of the best ways to show your appreciation for this year podcast, Pull to Open, is to leave a review, of course, in the podcast app, podcast app you're listening in, especially Apple Podcasts. And guys, I don't think we said this. This is the actually the 100th episode 
of pull to open. So if you uh, were waiting for your signal to leave a review for this podcast, here we are. We've done a hundred of these things, guys. Come on. That's it's right. okay. Show some appreciation. Go ahead. Leave a review in your app. Uh, they really do help. That will make the show more visible to listeners who really want to get this great discussion of Doctor Who. Yeah. 100 episodes really means that you can you can now do a uh, percentage score. Uh, mm -hmm. if, you, if you liked uh, the the episodes that you've listened to, uh, give us that percentage, translate it into five stars or however many stars you think we're worth. Uh, I think uh, 100 quality episodes uh, translates to five stars. Uh, and then and you of course, also, well, you should also, share it with you should share the podcast too with a hundred yes. friends, right? Hundred. <laughs> 100 episodes, yeah. you've earned 100 shares. So go ahead. Just keep That's hitting right. that share button. Pick up the first 100 people from your contacts list and just blast it out to them. I'm sure that's a great idea. Yeah, uh, But no, that, sharing with a friend mistakes. is a great way yep. to yep. show your appreciation too. <laughs> Minimum 100 friends. Uh, but also one thing you can do when you leave that review is put a Doctor Who title, the title of an episode, title of an old series story, uh, in that review in the form of emoji uh, and then what Pete will do we'll, is he will describe that emoji to me mm -hmm. and or a guest that we may have. Yeah. Well, this be. is the great thing that we didn't tell Brian about. Now he's been recruited <laughs> into this game show we like to call the Humoji Challenge. That's right. Where Which I get to... Shots behind us. Yeah, I get to yeah. describe emojis and they end up being Doctor Who titles. Uh, and I think you might be familiar with this one, Brian. Uh, so... Oh. Okay. I've even done a card on it, perhaps. Oh. Um, so we'll do uh, we'll we'll do this in a second. Uh, are you guys ready? As I'll ever be. Yeah, absolutely. I don't. Uh, we don't seem to be supplied with buzzers, but um, <laughs> but that's that's okay. Um, I, I've I've you know what I've I've seen Brian in uh, in uh, Star Wars quiz situation before, and and he's lethal. So uh, <laughs> that was your. You, you're the the one person who witnessed that 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 victory on that cruise ship that time. Oh, <laughs> nice! That one time story one for time. another time. That Star Wars at sea time. Yes. Uh, All right. But yeah, I, if it's if it's a one from the from Brian's uh, era from his trading card era, that could be. Could be. That's good. All right. All right, guys. Pencils down, and here we go. <laughs> Three emojis. First emoji. Little uh, baby with halo and wings. Okay. Second emoji, takeout box. Third emoji, Statue of Liberty. Angels in Manhattan. Angel, Boom! Angels, yes. Or is it Angels Take? Oh, the Angels Take Manhattan. Yes, there you go. Judges, judges, like the Muppets. judges judged it. <laughs> Accurate enough. Yeah. Oh angels God. Take Manhattan. <laughs> Now, there it is, folks. Now I'm the seeing a Weeping Angels Muppet crossover. My goodness. Yeah, That's... I've watched that. Yeah, I'd watch the hell out of that. That's amazing. Folks, uh, yes, RTD, call us. tune in next week for our next Humoji Challenge, which could be from you. By the way, that comes up. That one Humoji Challenge came to us from Gabriel Canada, who uh, has given us a few lately. He also did the one last week with the, the Daemons, which Chris also got fairly quickly. Yes. Um, did, did we decide if it was called the demons or the demons or the demons? I'm going with demons just because I think that's what okay. Pertwee calls it in the episode. Okay. So I believe uh, the doctor, which I probably yeah, shouldn't well, given rule number one. Rule number um, one. <laughs> but no, you two can submit a Humoji challenge either via review or go ahead and drop us a line on social. We're at pull to open 63 on Twitter, Instagram, and Facebook, or our most active social network, TikTok. You can leave one there at pull to open all one word. So folks, not only can you interact with us on those platforms, Spotify listeners, I am talking to you. You can do more there. You can rate this show, pull to open, or even the episode on your app. As you know, go ahead and give it a star rating. That's pretty easy, but you can also interact with us on a little something we like to call poll to open because you can use the mm -hmm. poll feature there to let us know what you think of the story uh, that we're about to talk about. So we're talking about Knock Knock this week, but we uh, you can also, we rate the show. We rate, we're gonna rate that episode as either a good episode, a bad episode, a so-so episode. We have the special ratings for that, uh, Daleks, Ogrons, et cetera. We'll explain all that at the, at the end of the show. 
Um, but you too can go in your app and give your rating. So go ahead and do that. And we will talk, talk about it at a future podcast like we're about to do now. So I mentioned we were recently at Frontier in Space. We have some results for Frontier in Space. All right. That's so exciting. it looks I, like... I don't look at these results, but uh, yeah, you've, you've got the latest news coming in that paper. And I do. They're coming in. So, okay. There is a split, guys. An even split between the Viscount Banger, the top rating, and the Dalek. It's basically both of those are neck and neck. So some people think it's like one of the best of the best, and some people think it is a very solid episode. There is a little bit. They're each, they're each there around 33%. Whereas... The Professor Hater, which of course is a not so great episode, but at least they tried something, uh, is right around 10%. And there's actually like a fair amount of people who called it a fixed point in time, which is odd, which hmm. is that that's our rating we use for like when you can't really rate it, often for reasons of nostalgia, which might be the case here, as it is from a sort yeah. of a very earlier episode of very early ep era of Doctor Who. So I, I to it's hard to know what these people were thinking when they gave it the fixed point in time, but I would suspect that that they see problems with the story, but they freaking love that reveal probably yeah. in the last, the last episode, which so is a pretty good the, reveal. So there were no Ogron votes, no Ogron and votes. This, Isn't most, that crazy? This is the most Ogron rich, literally <laughs> uh, episode story in Dr. Who history. And we got no Ogrons. Wow. None. I thought it was going to skew heavily for the Ogrons. I thought it was going to be like just people just rated an Ogron just because, hey, Ogrons are in it. How often do I get a chance to rate an Ogron episode with an Ogron? Yeah, uh, but no. But no, but nobody. No. Well, that's well, good. Well, that's good to know. We 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 do have a generally positive uh, audience here on Pull to Open. We know that the people are very positive about Doctor Who. We like to keep it positive. Uh, you know, we don't like to rate anything an Ogron unless it really, really deserves it. But glad that we've got so many frontier and space lovers thank you for voting and cool. uh yeah yeah i think that's have, have we have we wrapped up the well i'd just like to the mention whole... the last uh, thing that place you can follow us of course is on youtube we're at youtube.com slash pull to open it really helps the show if you follow us there as well so please check it out plus you get to see all the cool stuff in our backgrounds especially yours brian we were just talking yeah. about that before we started the show and i i Whenever someone has a salacious crumb ready to tackle at whatever they're about to say, got to admire that. Hell yeah. Gotta get one. I've only got like a Dalek that'll scream something or here in, in the back, but it's all good. By the way, I, I'm, I'm finally making up for uh, the war games. I, finally got this, I got this poster from the uh, um, Doctor, one of the more recent Doctor Who magazines, and I didn't get it in time for our War Games podcast. <laughs> so now, no, so the, the War in. Games will always be with us yeah. in spirit. Absolutely. All right, all right, y'all. The time this has is. happened. The time has come yeah. to uh, to knock at the door. We're not knocking four times, but we're knocking two times. And uh, the the knock okay. at the door is telling us that it is time. For the segment that we call TLDW, Too Long, Didn't Watch, Indeed. or Too Long, Doctor Who, in which one of us uh, takes uh, a minute per New Who episode, a 30 seconds per Classic Who episode, to describe the story. Uh, this is New Who. We are back in the new era after a long, long exile. So it is one minute, and this time it is Pete. It is your turn. And is it? Okay. Here. Red glow in your face tells me that you have closed all your tabs. You are flying no notes. here. No notes. No notes. No capes. No notes. And uh, you, sir, have one minute to describe the entire plot of Knock Knock. Are you ready? Well, I would just have one request that as I get yeah. closer to the end of the minute, can you start creaking the floorboards wherever <laughs> you are so it sounds like someone sneaking up behind me and I just really really rush it to the end i think that would help. yes absolutely uh and all then right. you get revived at the end and it's all over uh but <laughs> yes uh we will we'll creak some floorboards make sure to do it in binaural audio which this oh. episode was was taped in um and okay I just listen to it that way but that <laughs> save was, it for the was... notes save it for the yeah. commentary okay all right we'll get there we'll get there. Right. i'm just giving you a little bit of extra time uh time to busk and info dump all in one um so here we go with the official pull to open summary of knock knock in one minute, starting in three, two, 
one, go. So Bill is looking for a place to live and she gets together with a bunch of college students and they can't find anything that they can afford. But then this creepy landlord sort of says, hey, can you need a place to live? And he shows them his castle and it's super cheap for some reason. So they take it, but something's going on. One of the people, something happens to him, the who, guy who moves in early. So, but then the Bill gets her stuff moved with by the doctor. He uses the TARDIS to move in there. And then he suddenly realizes something's going on here. This is a weird house that shouldn't be this cheap. Uh, there's a creepy landlord. It, maybe he's old. Maybe maybe he's like seconds. crazy old. Who knows? He's going to stay and investigate. Bill doesn't like that initially, but sort of she reluctantly uh, acquiesces to him doing it. And he basically finds out that there's this this house which has been uh, sort of creepily like getting rid of people every 20 years or so uh, is actually infected with this lice, this space lice. And it's actually because this guy is the son of this woman who has been restored by the lice into this wood form. And he realizes that he gets her, the woman to, to uh, gets the woman to basically give, to kill, uh, not kill, <laughs> basically to sacrifice <laughs> themselves so that the other people can live. And then Bill's flatmates are restored and they uh, go live somewhere else. <laughs> All right. <laughs> Good, good, good job. Only 20 seconds. That was over. not a good job. <laughs> Don't patronize me. No, I failed. Use too many words. I mean, this is the problem with New Who, right? They they do pack so much into to less than an hour. Well, I actually was a little optimistic going into this. I don't think there was as much. I think I uh, like like you like most of these TLDWs. You just end up spending way too much time on the setup when it really should have just been like summarizing. Like, okay, weird house, yeah. space lights, <laughs> horror movie vibes. That's it. Yeah, the, um, the classic the classic honey trap in uh, in TLDWs is to spend like thirty seconds on the cold open, uh, <laughs> which is not quite what you did here, but it, you it was, but like it, probably it, about it's, twenty. It's I feel like writing the cards. I've kind of been cured of that because I have to fit the whole first third. Yeah, like I have to get to the big turn in a hundred words on the first card. So yeah, so we we should have had it's you rough. do it, Brian. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> you should. You should. I, Jumped in on this, but no, it's, it's a, it's a pretty tight episode. I mean, you almost, you might almost call it a bottle episode, but I mean, it is, uh, it's, it's a little, I think, tonally refreshing in Dr. Who, uh, in that it sort of starts with this really mundane thing of college students trying to find a place to live mm. and then does the whole Dr. Who thing of having the turn, uh, of it being like, oh, this super creepy house. And obviously there's there's uh something strange afoot but i like that they hold on to that mundanity sort of yes. through the first act essentially and that it's it's to me this is a really good showcase of pearl mackey and bill and bill's life and seeing her in that inner sort of everyday environment and contrasting that with like her relationship with the doctor and um so so on that level it works but it also yeah. sort of mixes in some pretty decent creepy horror vibes. I mean, I think, you know, we can talk about how all that's resolved, but I think in terms of atmosphere and the way they sort of technically realize the creepiness, um, I thought that all was very, very good. So, so let me set up just a little bit of the, the background of the story. It's a 2017 story. Mm -hmm. Uh, and, uh, it's as you, yes, as you say, Pete, that there's, there's a lot of sort of mundane details of 2017 student life. Uh, they're, they're listening to Spotify. Uh, we have, by the way, now a Spotify bingo. Uh, this is the only Doctor Who episode ever to mention Spotify, so we, we got that one. <laughs> so far. Um, so far. It's also a Little Mix bingo. Have you guys ever heard of Little Mix? Did that come out of nowhere? <laughs> they, nope. They are Wrong generation. Yeah, well, they're supposedly the biggest girl band in the world, um, according to Spotify. Uh, but I, I really, I haven't met anyone inside, outside the UK who's ever heard of them. So those are the uh, but, tunes they're listening to later, I guess, yes. when they're chilling, when the doctor's chilling with the flatmates, <laughs> yes, staying up late. Great, great episode for Capaldi to to not play his age, um, which is wonderful. <laughs> play around with his age um, and, and the doctor's vanity in that regards. Um, uh, it is a little weird because the doctor is supposed to be uh, a lecturer, a professor at the university that presumably all these students go to. Yeah, St. Louis. Well, he also was, was kind of famous, right? Like, like in the yeah. pilot, they talk about how 
you know, his lectures, he's been lecturing there for a long time and that they're, they're kind of like his lectures are legendary or something not quite legendary, but yeah, mm-hmm. you think they would know who he is. Um, again, doctor who's never been that consistent about it, but even within the same season, you would think that would be a thing. The other thing is that bill, I don't think they even, uh, this is not like this is a contradiction, but she wasn't a student originally. Right. Like she was, oh, yeah. she worked in the kitchen that's right. And I actually forget if she ends up becoming a student because of how she interacts with the doctor. Well, uh, uh, go ahead. Go ahead. I, I think to, to answer that, though, I mean, how often in a college, colleges are huge. How often do you know the professors of a study, a field of study different from yours? And that group of sure. students was pretty diverse in like, why would that music student be? listening to anything about the doctor, you know what I mean? Or, or yeah, anything sure. he was lecturing on. Yeah. And that makes sense. Yeah. Speaking of the, the students, oh, there was one guy oh. named Harry who was supposed to be originally in the script. They, they don't make reference to it at all. The grandson of Harry Sullivan. Uh, right. From, from the Tom Baker era, uh, you know, who's in the arc in space. So uh, interesting randomizer connection there. Uh, but yes, 2017, this is an episode by Mike Bartlett who uh, had long wanted to write for Doctor Who, as a lot of, lot of writers do. Uh, you know, Doctor Who at this stage in the UK is just sort of famous for being famous, right? David Suchet, uh, who appears as the landlord in this episode, uh, was famously Poirot before it, um, uh, said yes to the script without, without even seeing it, you know, mm. sight unseen, uh, because it's Doctor Who and because he wanted a chance to work with Peter Capaldi again, uh, which he'd done in Poirot. Um, but it was... Very much uh, so. Mike Bartlett's a, a playwright. He wrote the play King Charles the Third, which I've actually written a story about. It was about you know sort of the the beginning of the real King Charles the Third's era before it actually began. Uh, which oh was, yeah, you would mentioned that before. Yeah, yeah. yeah. So I, I've I've written about that and how it's nothing like the actual real King Charles the Third's era. Uh, Speaking of modernity, right? Indeed, but he he zeroed in on the mundanity. Uh, he mm-hmm. uh, you know he was like, I know that Stephen Moffat likes it when there are you know regular mundane things like you know, and Doctor Who has never done like houses. Mm-hmm. Uh, you know, well, I mean the lodger of houses, the lodger. Yeah, that's the thing is that they kind of have right. I mm-hmm. mean, and and would Blink be you know as powerful well, as it is without the haunted house aspect? And funny, funnily enough, the the house they use here in Knock Knock is the same one they use in Blink for for oh, Western Drudlums. Um, yeah. It just dresses up were- slightly differently. Those werewolf episodes in um, David Tennant's early years too have that haunted house vibe. Yeah, oh yeah, Tooth and Claw. Claw. Yeah, yeah, definitely. Yeah, I mean, let's talk. Let's talk a little and- bit about the creepiness there and and the horror movie vibes of this. How did you guys think it, it did? Did it pull it off? Did is this is kind of like a creepy Doctor Who episode? And you know, obviously, Doctor Who is limited to some extent in how scary it can be, and you know, certainly you can't really have gore in the same way like a real horror movie could. But you know, it does. It's it it it, it can pull off scary stuff. Do you think? How do you think this did? And and uh, in comparison to things like. Tooth and Claw and Blink and whatever else. I think, I, like I said, I watched this with my eight-year-old and I love watching their reactions or, 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 you know, kids' reactions to it. And the way I realized, I mean, it wasn't like scary for me. They put the atmosphere together and it was like, oh, I can see, you know, intellectually how this is creepy uh, and it's interesting. But watching her cover her eyes and... Mm during a few different parts and then at the end go that wasn't so scary (laughs) made me feel like they hewed that line really well like like disney's haunted mansion where it's really intense uh, at the the beginning and then structurally it it releases that pressure valve so that with those younger audiences can feel like they've been through something but they could get through it and that's where to me it felt like it really, it really hewed that line really well. Mm. Mm. Yeah, it's interesting. So I, I, I did not watch this with with a kid, but I did watch it with uh, a a non Doctor Who fan uh, who's in her fifties and uh, was unprepared, I think, for for sort of the, the creepy horror vibe of this. And as soon as we start mm. to see the lice, her question was, "Oh, is is it gross out 
horror as well? Like, is it going to mm. be like all blood and guts? They're going to digest the skeleton. Um, so it's interesting that they, they do just, they, they disappear the bodies, which is almost creepier in a mm. way if you don't have the gore in those scenes. But yeah, it definitely had uh, a creepier vibe to me on the second viewing uh, than it did on the first, uh, possibly because I was watching it on the big screen for the first time. And not like, I, I guess I was on the road the first time I saw this on, on a small screen on an iPad or something like that. And uh, it definitely, it, it holds up very well, I think, on the big screen, uh, with or without the, the binaural audio. It it has um, the the lice, the, the dryads or uh, what he was trying to call them because he didn't want to call them lice because that's silly. Mm. Um <laughs> It had the the Indiana Jones gross out scene vibe, right? Like this is the this is the episode of the season that has the, you know, the bugs like you have the sequence in Temple of Doom or whatever. You know what I mean? It had that uh-huh. same sort yeah. of feeling. It's interesting that you mentioned that because I, I thought of that, too, because I was actually trying to pinpoint why I wasn't creeped out by the bugs. And this might just be an effects thing because they're obviously so clearly CGI um, whereas in Temple of Doom, all, those are real bugs. Like that's very, you know, there's the well before CGI and it's all practical effects. Um, cause I, I really wasn't creeped out by the bugs. I, I, I thought, I thought in terms of my creep meter, they raise it really high at the beginning. And I think it's it, for about the first half. It's really, really great. Once the bug shows up, I feel like it sort of goes, starts to go down a bit. I think I gotta say, Chris, I don't know if I was as scared by the people disappearing or just kind of confused, you know, mm-hmm. like I, there's, there's sort of a confusion there of like, well, wait a minute, what exactly happened? And then again, realizing, I know they can't really show gore, mm-hmm. but it was just so sudden and weird. Um, and then I, I do think it picks up a little bit when Eliza shows up in the last act and we can talk about her in yeah. a few minutes. But uh, I think the, the thing that I didn't like in, in the whole creepiness of it is, more the end where everyone is sort of reconstituted mm-hmm. and the, that just seems so cheap to me in that, like now uh, the horror stuff I was supposed to be scared by, I, I is no longer going to stay with me. Now I'm just like, Oh, they were, they were kind of never really in any think- danger. And usually like, even, even though all the criticism I have of the effects and whatever I think is valid. I think if they had, kept the kids dead yes it's a darker ending but that's kind of the point right then then it sort of stays with you i think Uh, that would have fundamentally changed uh the doctor's relationship with bill and how bill reacts to things and it would have it would have changed the meta plot significantly to have something that dark and that uh lethal just in a in a middle of of an episode like this and so like they wouldn't have been able to do that without changing the trajectory of the rest of the season hmm. maybe i don't know but, but like while you're during the episode you're thinking oh they're dead <laughs> like surely yeah. you might like this is the first time you've seen this right i mean did you think they were going to simply just be reconstituted by the end i just um, felt like i mean like i have this this feeling that like generally the doctor reacts more viciously when death is permanent, right? Because there is this idea that he can save everybody, right? Mm -hmm. How many great episodes end with him going, nobody dies today. And his solutions more often than not result in bringing people back, preventing their deaths in the first place, whatever. So like, there's always something in the back of my mind going like, Oh, they've been dissipated. There's no gore. Maybe there is a chance for him to bring them back. And maybe that's just a function of my optimism or faith in the doctor, which might be misplaced. Um, But there are definitely situations where he's gone through and, and done the impossible to bring those folks back in episodes. And it's been very dramatic. To your Just point, maybe it was everyone lives. <laughs> yeah, like like maybe it was less dramatic here than it has been in some others, but it, that's always kicking in the back of my mind as far as the doctor goes. Hmm. Hmm. So so Brian, you you're not familiar with the rest of the season. Uh no. So first of all, I gotta ask you, you, you don't know who who or what is in the vault, right? We have the scene. <laughs> that was very tantalizing and that's i think part of what made valkyrie and i both go like we need to catch up like right now on this Mm -hmm. um because i just 
I had skipped over this season specifically. And, and yeah, that's uh, really something I want to know more about. We got to commission some, some Capaldi trading cards from you <laughs> just to make sure. Well, no, I'm going to, I'm going to, I'm going to take them through. I'm going to, ta- I'm going to go through them pretty quickly actually. Cause Valkyrie wants to go through them now and I'm going to strike while that iron's hot because once you have, once you have her interest, she'll be, she'll be all on board. So love it so, well uh, I, glad glad to know that you don't know so pete and i will avoid yeah. any spoilers on who or what is in the vault i actually thought it was kind of became a little too obvious with this this ending which is something that moffat wrote and kind of tacked on to the end uh yeah i like but, uh, what, he, what he said mentions like a lot of kids die or something like that i forget exactly the exact line but he's like good and it's yes. like the, the delighted music that Starts up, it's like okay, we hear pop kind of goes the weasel, whereas right. previously, uh, for Elise had been playing, uh, very interesting. Uh, pop goes the weasel, maybe it's uh, Francis Ford Coppola and uh, it's a godfather <laughs> reference. Who knows? Um, yeah, I will say the yeah. bookends of this story are really good, like the mundanity mm. of like finding the place, and uh, it was so good the way they had that tiny house, like between the two other houses, and like the there's a uh, a bedroom under the stairs, like a Harry Potter bedroom, essentially <laughs> at some point. Yeah. And it's like, but that's actually real, right? Like I've seen places like that. Oh, like yeah. when I was looking for places and like in my early twenties and stuff, it's like, Oh yeah, this is, and uh, that, that, was, that was actually a student housing shortage in, in mm. Britain around this time. So it was actually playing on, on real headlines. Uh, but yeah, to, to me, the least realistic aspect of that is the notion that none of their devices uh, could be charged from the from the mains, like the, the old power sockets. Right. And they were still there. Like, they didn't consider that a deal breaker. That doesn't seem realistic to me. With uh, they figured they could well, just get an adapter. I mean, as a, a father of a, a 20 and a 21-year-old, they're not paying attention to stuff like that. They, they have no idea. My kids would totally rent that place and go like, it's cheap and I can get out of the house. Like, wait a second. What do you mean? I can't plug in my devices. I'll figure that out tomorrow and then call right. me and go, can you figure this out for me? Yeah. Um, can you just totally. deliver battery packs every day? Yeah. No, yeah, exactly. <laughs> no, you nailed it. Like exactly. That's exactly the mentality of, of early twenties. Just like, whatever it's, it is what it is. And it's great because it's mine. You know, I've, I've got this yeah. place. Um, but I also love that they, that the TARDIS is now used as like a, a moving to, to move Bill's stuff. And again, this, this utterly mundane thing. And she's using her, her buddy with the t- space time ship <laughs> to do it. I like, yeah, that's what you do. Like, why not? Who else are you going to call to help you move? I liked how she used the TARDIS's power to like bring all of her stuff in, but then was so embarrassed by him in front of her friends that she wouldn't let him bring it all the way in. Well, let's yeah. talk about that. I really love, the, love those scenes where she, she's basically having him all interact with her new friends that she's only known for a little bit right now at this point, but she's kind of like, all right, uh, thanks for helping me move uh, bugger off. And I think it's, it's cute. And I feel like the intent is that she's young, he's old. You're, you're, you know, you're killing my buzz here, man uh Mm -hmm. take off but i actually read that as look thanks for your help moving my stuff but you're i know where you're around doctor there's trouble and she's kind of doing this thing where it's like i just want you out of here because i don't want trouble with these people there's going to be trouble if you stay there's going to be some robot or something's going to happen and if you just leave then everything will be fine, you know? And it's not, it's, it's just weird sort of Doctor Who logic that is, I think is totally believable. But I think that's like her true motivation is that she just wants some normalcy. The, 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 the vibe I got from it was like, she wanted to wall off at least a piece of her life from him hmm. too, right? Like that she needed something for herself. And you see that with other companions where, the doctor takes over completely. And I mean, Amy and Rory had that conversation where it's like, there's doctor time and not doctor time. And the longer they were with him, the more not doctor time they had. And it became more normal, normal and mundane. And they didn't guard against that at all. Like anytime he showed up, it was just into the TARDIS with them. And so I think Bill's maybe smarter than them at that point, trying to, to, to wall off that garden from the get go. 
Yeah, well, yeah, it's definitely a thing throughout New Who, right? It, not, it, nothing like this was ever explored in the old series. Uh, but with New Who, it's definitely a case of, like, each companion gets more and more of a life outside the Doctor, you know, starting even with Rose. You know, we see we see uh, Rose's life before we see a life with the Doctor. And then we continue to see it. We continue to see her, her family and her relationship with Mickey develop and... Uh, well, so this I would sort of say seems like the natural combination of that. It's not just a new who thing. I, I think it's kind of a Moffat thing because mm. if you think about Davies, it's kind of the reverse in certain episodes, which is to say that there's something weird afoot in whatever's going on. This is usually a setup to certain episodes. Something weird is afoot. Let's call the doctor. You know, mm. like remember how Mickey is sort of keeping an eye on the school in the school reunion right. and. Uh, even actually, even in the Moffat era, like the power of three was kind of like that, you know, they had the cubes come out and then they, you know, we need the doctor here. And here it's like, it's to me, it's like, it's clear you need the doctor here. Like there's a creepy landlord and the, the guy's missing and you, and you're shooing him away. Why, why surely you'd want him to come and investigate. But of course she's like, I think in her mind, she's sort of thinking he's the cause of that. Like because he's here, just the simple fact of his presence, like there's going to be alien shit, and, and right. whether right. or not that that's true, sense. I mean, you know, it's it's more like you kind of need the doctor now. So when he's like, when she's like, you're not leaving, are you? And he's like, no. It's and definitely it, it, of a piece with that sort yeah. of denial of like, no, no, this is a cheap house. Don't mess it up. Don't and it's make kind it of why a haunted house. It's kind of why I stumbled over it a bit in the TLDW because it's like I feel like this is sort of the the key sort of tension and, and the pivot point is when that scene where she's like, you're not leaving, are you? And she kind of acquiesces to it. And thankfully she does because like, <laughs> this, this is a, a space lice. Like you need, you need the time Lord. He's got to yeah, deal with it. At a certain point, your, your student-y uh, denial of, of the problem here has to end. Uh, and it, it does end with that wonderful pivot point of the, um, uh, the, the doctor asking the the landlord uh, to name the prime minister. Yeah, uh, which I thought was Good wonderful. Moment. And unfortunate that we have another Margaret Thatcher reference in Doctor Who. Not the only one. We do not have a Margaret Thatcher bingo. It's unfortunate <laughs> we have a Margaret Thatcher reference in life. Yes. Hey, hey, hey! hey. I'm sure she has fans. Hey. Yeah, uh, not, <laughs> if you if you are a Margaret Thatcher fan, please write in. Also, if you're a Harriet Jones Isn't fan, a good movie with um, her, like it was like the Iron Lady or something. Yeah. They can blame me. They can blame me for that. They can send the hate mail my way. <laughs> <laughs> I yeah, I have many things to say to Margaret Thatcher uh, about Margaret Thatcher. We we get there. I grew up in the north of England in the eighties. I have issues, um, but yeah, but we also it's it's that nice blend of you know real and imaginary, right? Uh, who's the prime minister? Margaret Thatcher, Harriet Jones. Yeah, um, of the Harriet Jones reference. Yes, Harriet Jones, comma prime minister, um, and and then uh, Eden and uh, I forget who the other one is. Uh, Macmillan, um, uh, right about that, and he never answers uh, who who the current prime minister is, which is uh, kind of a shame because I would love to know who in current who chronology actually is the prime minister at this point. Um, hmm. and in uh, 2017 I believe it would have been Theresa May hopefully it wasn't actually Theresa May in the Who universe and they've, they've got a, uh, a fake Prime Minister in there but yeah we don't know we don't get to find out um, but to the other point I just wanted to throw this in uh, you, the, the, the whole idea of the TARDIS is moving service now we've, we've had this uh, Brian we, we've sort of Experience a lot of TARDIS rich episodes here on Porto Open. The, the, the randomizer seems to be drawing attention to the different ways that you can use the TARDIS. Uh, a lot of it uh, is the, the question of whether it's a taxi service. Uh, we saw in the Peter Davison episode, Black Orchid, that the doctor does sometimes provide taxi service uh, to police officers. Uh, Harry Sullivan in Ark in Space uh, mentioned the idea of using the TARDIS as a way to hide policemen in Trafalgar Square. Never quite explained why that would be useful. And and Bill here is like, hey, you know, you could use the, rent this as, as a moving service. Um, but we do almost, almost have a TARDIS materializing around people or things bingo. Uh, hmm. Because it happens in Hellbent, Blink, Runaway Bride, Dinosaurs on a Spaceship, and all we need now is Parting of the Ways. Oh, the, the, yeah, that's right. <laughs> yeah okay 
So far. So yeah, so <laughs> far, so far. Um, but Brian, as a, as a Matt Smith fan, did you uh, did you feel like this was with with the wooden uh, the wooden woman at the end kind of gives very very Doctor Widow in the Wardrobe vibes, right? Uh, a little bit, yeah. I was more drawn to that, like when um, the Doctor made the connections to dry dryads and wood wood people and nymphs and things like that. That's kind of where my head went. So I was thinking along those lines of mythology. And if I had one disappointment, it's that he just sort of gave it that name and made it up and, and they didn't thematically tie that to any stories about nymphs or dryads because that's yeah. where I thought it was heading, to be honest. Um, and they do that so much through the show where they'll, he'll say like, or they'll, they'll say like, this is this alien thing is where this myth or story that you've got came from, whether that's werewolves or, or whatever. So I thought we were heading that direction and, and we didn't, but, um, I, I, I did get some some vibes because that's the episode where the the woman from World War II sort of takes yeah. that whole spirit of the forest in her head and uh, you know transports them. But I never got I never got a sense that anything like that is what was going on. I kind of felt like it was the other way around, where they yeah. were absorbing the people rather than putting themselves in people. Yeah, I wish they had they had spent a little more time i don't you know i don't want a big scene of exposition but honestly like what sort of ends up happening at the end it just doesn't really make a lot of sense like why would these space bugs want to restore her and even if they did like how does you know killing the people who come in help her and why would they kill one and not the other you know what i mean i guess you, you could bring a certain amount of headcanon to that and think like okay mm. she's the first thing they've encountered so maybe they've sort of turned her into some kind of mother creature um but then why every 20 years and then like how how does all this uh like what do they how does all this work really right and why why again why are the only the the most recent six like brought back like why not bring back everybody yeah. who has been consumed which would be a happier that. ending it'd be like and it'd be kind of fun too right it'd be like seeing people from the 70s and the 50s all here and uh, admittedly it would require sort of a quick like okay the doctor's got to take everybody back <laughs> in time right. or whatever which would probably yeah, they, you know bring up questions of paradox taxi service again yeah. <laughs> to, to take them back it's just there yeah. well, wasn't quite enough there i just needed a couple more lines of like this is why this is here it's just more like let's we wanted to do a wooden woman which looked great by the way i thought the mm. uh mm. It, like the the makeup and whatever sort of special effects they were doing was was really excellent especially when the bug is like crawling on her lip it's like super creepy um, so all that looked great. It just like why, how just a tiny bit more, I think would have made it, uh, made it a little more palatable as it was. It's called, you're, it's kind of a nothing burger, right? The, they, the sort of the inevitable thing happens where the bad guys get consumed and the good guys all come back. And it's sort of like, we just did that. Cause that's how we wanted to end it. And it's like, Oh, okay. <laughs> then it's just, yeah. again, like I said earlier, From- it just doesn't stay with you. From a writing perspective, my guess is they figured out what the reveal at the end would be and then just reverse engineered how they could make that work without putting too much more thought into it. And, you know, watching Doctor Who, there is a certain level of disbelief that people are going to suspend because maybe we're just too human to get it. And these aliens are weird and they're doing their thing or (laughs) whatever. You know what I mean? Like that's there's so maybe they were relying a little too much on that. Yeah, yeah, exactly. Like I, I all, I'm totally willing to go with wherever they want to go. I just want that place to be interesting and challenging, right? And I just don't think it it was. I think they kind of went for the easiest, yeah. most formulaic kind of happy ending. Uh, that was also simplest, right? They just didn't want to do a complicated scene with a whole bunch of extras and have some weird questions answered about what the doctor does to sort of fix that. They're just like, oh, no, let's just go back to the beginning, and it, it's kind of a reset button, and you're just going, kind of like, oh, okay. The the I mean the the explanation I kind of came up with in my head as I was watching it on the fly was that um, it, it took six people worth of energy to keep the house and her alive. Yeah, and it 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 
it got spent over 20 years, which is why they needed to replenish it. And so yeah. these people hadn't had time to be like digested, right? Like it was the right. wood equivalent of the, the Sarlacc pit where they're going to spend yeah. 20 years getting digested and they just hadn't been through that process yet. Right. And they right. busted yeah. out like Boba Fett. <laughs> nice, <laughs> nice reference. Uh, nice. Yeah, I love it. I, I, that's actually that actually works for me. And yeah, I, I'm sad that the the uh, crew from 1977 isn't going to come back and reclaim that David Bowie album. Um, <laughs> but uh, you know, really, someone should have saved that that vinyl. It's probably worth something. Um, but yeah, it's I, I kind of liked the uh, liked a lot of this. I like the fact that Capaldi is kind of. It's a really good episode for the Doctor to be kind of self-aware and self-parodying. Mm. Um, I like the way that he said Invasion of the Triads as if it were like the title of a 1970s <laughs> classic Who Hinchcliffe serial, right? And just, Invasion of the Triads. Like he, he kind of realizes that, hey, that'd be a good story. Um, he almost turns to camera in one of yeah. his mm. trademark yeah. Capaldi moments. Maybe you should use um, that but- title, sir. But it definitely continues this theme of Bill is asking all the questions that we should have been asking all along, right? The whole thing with Time Lords at the beginning, mm-hmm. which he notes how, how dumb Time Lords sound. Uh, and he's like, yeah. what, they, they wear big hats? He's, no, collars mostly, um, which is a wonderful line. And, and he, she, and, he and casually mentions... Aside by saying, yeah, well, you know, this is why I ran away. <laughs> so I I, like, he, oh, had, no. he had some of the best lines... Mm. I've seen him with like one of my favorites was when he's with um, the kid like locked in the kitchen and he's like, just, just don't be afraid. And he's like, why? He's like, cause it doesn't help. Like yeah. <laughs> that, <laughs> that, that <laughs> line was line. delivered with such, such a great deadpan that it was like, I'm on board with him, like no matter what he's doing and yes. him blundering his way through, like, he didn't study for what's going on any more than the writer did. So him trying to talk through everything is just sort of as like, I don't know. It's like late on a Saturday and I thought I was just going to hang out and watch some, like listen to music with some kids. Like (laughs) this all could happen. And it's bill. Like you said, that, that sort of pokes those holes and forces the reveal of, of who the landlord really is that Mm. felt really endearing. Um, that yeah. that felt like the point of the episode more than the alien, which is why I think I was a little bit more forgiving of how all of that worked because they did build to such a really good moment with that. Yeah. And it does kind of pivot right there at the end from, from being a horror story into really being a, a family story. Mm-hmm. Uh, yeah. You know, story about a mother and a son and uh, which I thought was, was, the second time around, I thought that was really effective. Like uh, uh, David Suchet's tears at the end, like my my goodness, is just he's yeah. really really good at weeping. Like, well, I guess we didn't get that very much in Poirot. And well, I also also like uh, as a parent, I actually really like the message of like take charge. You know, like this you're you're ultimately responsible here, and like he's he's doing he's living his life to please you, and you've got to be the one to set him straight because you're the parent. I mean, I just thought it's, it's just a nice message. And if you say it like great scene, like good effects. Uh, and again, even I'm not super thrilled with the entire resolution um, structurally, I thought it really worked. Yeah. It's interesting. I mean, it, you know, Star Wars is kind of a family drama in a lot of ways, right? The, the, the main mm-hmm. series of movies. And, and we've got an interesting pivot of family drama here in a way that I hadn't seen before. And uh, it is interesting, like, you know, both, both of you guys watch this with, with your daughters. Like it's an interesting mm-hmm. uh, uh, father daughter kind of uh, story to watch, right? Because of that reveal at the end of the, you know, the, the daughter is mother to the father really. And, and, you know, and it's, it's, ultimately all the same it's ultimately like you, you do whoever is the parent has to let the child go or it, encourage it, the child to leave the nest it was an interesting conversation i had with valkyrie afterward because i asked her point blank i was like would you do that like if i were gonna die tomorrow like would you do that and she's like no i wouldn't want you to be wooden but also like that's the way things are like parents parents die and we have to let go um 
she's been through a lot of death as an eight year old. So she's like, she's been dealing with some grief and it's been something she's been working on with a therapist. Um, so I'm not surprised by that answer, but like, um, it was, it was kind of refreshing to get. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Wow. That's powerful. Uh, so yeah, how did, uh, you, you were watching it with Grace. Yeah, I watched it with, actually watched it with the whole family. They, uh, <clears throat> the, they, everybody gathers around for New Who. Grace is, I think, the only one patient enough to <laughs> sit through Classico with me anymore. But um, Jack was there too. So Jack is my son. He's thirteen. He thought it, he he liked it uh, when it, when you know now now that they've we're we're kind of the podcast family. When when it cuts to credits at the end, Jack will give his review and he'll just he just <laughs> a Dalek. That was a Dalek. Um, and Grace said it basically. She said it was okay. Uh, I think she was a little freaked out early on just because I think the the technical direction of the scares and sort of the jump scares and the timing of the sound with the creaks and all that stuff was just creepy. So she was creeped out, but I don't think she was ever fully scared. And then the end, she was, you know, just kind of noncommittal. Um, but yeah, all the, I got to say, I got to give points to just like that those those technicalities in how they timed everything earlier on like especially mm. one of my favorite bits is when um how did they ask they're there in the in that middle scene like how do we get to the tower and he just uh david sache just turns like you don't mm. and it's sort of that little bit of a turn like the little and there's like i think there might even be like a lightning flash at the right then or something it, it just feels like there's like oh okay and then but he also like corrects himself a second later like oh i was just really creepy wasn't i haha <laughs> everything's okay and you know all those little bits early on i think do do a hell of a lot to sort of uh, set it up and so grace really appreciated it um and yeah my wife megan she watched it she thought it was a fine episode um yeah she she likes uh this era capaldi especially even the earlier ones in rtd so as a new who you know again everyone just thought it was kind of okay um so there's not it's it's not mm. the greatest episode ever it has some good things in it um but you know there there it's are definitely some a good one for for like you know yeah. you, you you could kind of introduce someone to doctor who with this because it does showcase the fact that the doctor is use, uses his mind right uses his skills of deduction he's, he's a little bit of a sherlock holmes character uh, because that's what he's doing throughout this he's kind of like oh you said this and then you know and he puts together the 70 years thing uh to to figure out the reveal um well also what you said nice. earlier i think is a really good reason to start with something like this which is bill bill is great she's one of mm. the best companions to do that bridge between the regular world and the doctor who world and especially that sort of questioning with him early on that we were just talking about um she she milks that throughout this season i remember we did smile yeah um yeah. there's a ton of that in that one where she's learning about the doctor and this you know life he leads in uh jumping around the cosmos everywhere and it seems like yeah. i think every the episode of why is it a police box like you know that that's tackled in smile and yeah there's, there's yeah. a lot of that yeah bill is just such a refreshing companion i mean in series 10 i mean i, I think most people are <laughs> nine out of ten whovians agree bill is uh the best 10th uh sorry 12th doctor companion so uh, yeah, I, and it's it's great that she's not just sort of the you know the to the token LGBTQ character, right? Right. You know, it's not just like, hey, I'm here and I'm the first LGBTQ, you know, uh, you know, full on, like you know, not just implied like with Jack Harkness, but full on. Yes, I like girls, you know, uh, but but she's also like you know got this curiosity thing going on and this knack of just zeroing in on questions that we should have been asking all along. Like uh, she's got um. She's got a very blue collar look at it. Yes. Right. Mm -hmm. If that makes sense. It's, it's very just like, why, why are you doing this? Like not putting up with the pretension that maybe some of the other companions had. Yeah. Yeah. She's a bit Rose like in that sense, I think. Well, um, she's great at asking yeah. questions for sure. Uh, yes. But so are we. <laughs> and also answering them in a little play section. We like to call the four questions to doomsday. Knock, knock four times for the four questions. First question. Why did the randomizer take us here? What do we so, think? So I was uh, just recently listening to our last episode on the mutants. Um, I think at one point, did we mention the word lice? 
Yeah, did we? <laughs> I seem to remember we mentioned lice. Why did we? Because yeah, everyone's we, hair was long. Why did we say lice? I don't. Oh yeah, my, was it the Professor Songard with the bald head? We're like, oh, at least he doesn't oh, have to worry yeah, about lice. Yeah, yeah. It's probably him. Okay. Uh, so that makes sense. But we have had a bit of a bug thing going on, as mm -hmm. I mentioned. Like we we had the Wurren in Arkham Space. Uh, the, the mutants turn into, you know, bugs and then butterflies. Uh, so I got to ask, is the randomizer an entomologist? Is that that's what's going on here? Not just, you know, the, the randomizer seems to have certain preferences. One of them is uh, Capaldi. Uh, mm -hmm. Another is episodes with curious uses of the TARDIS. And, and another, I think we're discovering now, is bugs. Randomizer loves yeah. bugs. Yeah, it's liking the bugs. So there's definitely that connection to the Arkham space. There's the Harry Sullivan thing. You mentioned, mm. and by the way, I'm really glad they didn't do that because there's yeah. really, I mean, presumably if there were, if they were going to do it, they would put some lines in it, but I just feel like it's kind of the dumbest thing to name the guy the same name as Harry Sullivan. <laughs> yes. Like they're both named Harry. It's like, okay, I guess you could, yeah, you know, again, argue, but if like, if you're not going to find that out. You know? Yeah. And it's like, Harry, how is it even a thing? Right. Him. It's like, it's kind of yeah. like to my, remember when we did, um, the doctor, the widow in the wardrobe. And I was hard on that episode for making an Androzani reference with lit mm -hmm. literally only to make an Androzani reference. And uh, yeah. I feel like, you know, not, not withstanding what they might've written if they had gone that way, but it, it, it feels like this would have been that let's just make a Harry Sullivan reference for the sake of it. Uh, and not even in a sort of a yeah. clever oblique way, like they do in the Zygon inversion where he sort of just says the name All imbecile. Right. And it's more of a, implication than a than a, a outright reference so um yeah, yeah maybe I, I guess like if you think about it if they did do that harry sullivan would have been the most referenced former companion Seriously. of the capaldi era um yeah yeah so there's that. that we did that we did the zygons and there's that harry reference yeah the randomizers low-key a uh, harry sullivan fan and i guess the other th thing i would say is like in the mutants i feel like there was a point we talked about how Pertwee was taking his duty of care seriously mm, with Joe, yes. uh, which was a nice sort of undertone of that episode. And I feel like there's a lot of that here. I feel like him being, you know, his, her quote on Bill's <laughs> grandfather um, mm. or whatever, like this is, this is basically what he's doing here. He's, he's looking out for her and refusing to leave and, you know, solving this problem, which needs solving um, even though she's trying to sort of, you know, shoo him. So, um, I think there's a, there's a little bit of a parallel there in terms of his how he regards his companions and his duty to them in both. Yeah, and the, the grandfather reference, obviously a nice nice callback to Susan, mm. uh, the very first companion. We still don't know anything about the grandfather granddaughter relationship there, but uh, it, it might be nice to kind of throw in a reference to that, like, oh no, don't don't call me grandfather. You know that 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 brings up all sorts of associations. I don't know how mm. you would write that in, but. Uh, but yeah, 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 nice. So before moving on to the second question, Brian, I know you haven't been accompanying us on our entire random journey, but just wanted to throw it out to you if you had any ideas on why the randomizer might have taken here, not necessarily making connections to what we've done, but maybe like why knock knock would be a good thing uh, to watch now here in uh, July <laughs> 2023. Well, I, I think I might have had something to do with it. It was funny, like when when Chris asked me to come on, um, I've been really busy on deadlines and he was like, well, the randomizers got this like, you know, huge epic classic who series and I don't have the surface to get the classic who stuff right now. And, uh, he's like, well, I'll just let you know the next time we're in the era and the chances of it picking one of the 10 episodes I haven't seen mm, yes. yeah. seems absurd. And so it was, <laughs> it was just to get me to go, you know, light a fire under me. And, uh, and, and get me to go finish episode, that. Picking an episode that Valkyrie likes as well. So yeah. To get her yeah. into it. So that's, that's a wonderful. With I love it themes. when the randomizer yeah. does this. It, it creates new fans. It actually, when we went to the Doctor's Wife, uh, if you remember our, our guest that time uh, from the Doctor Who show, uh, Dave, he was, um, you know, he, 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 he rage quit the series at that point, right? So it got right. him back into it. So yeah, the randomizer is kind of just sort of making uh, new new Who fans, reviving uh, Who fandom uh, all around. It's kind of uh, yeah, it's 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 dispensing little bits of Who joy everywhere. So uh, thank you, randomizer. yeah. It's prescient, yeah. if nothing yes. else. I will also say one more thing there, which is that we've been 
at uh, a number of uh, Pertwee episodes, and we always associate Pertwee with being, you know, stuck on Earth. And here, here we go from Pertwee not being stuck on Earth, right? You right. Know, in two two space episodes, like before and after the Three Doctors, before he's liberated from his exile, uh, with uh, contrasting that with a Capaldi episode from the season where he is kind of. Yeah, right. Deliberately exiled on Earth. Deliberately, deliberately stuck on Earth and then deliberately giving himself missions <laughs> throughout. <Yes. laughs> even though he's stuck on Earth. So I love that comparison. Good job, Randomizer. All right, moving on to the second question, which is what if the evil plot had succeeded? So okay, so All right. if the evil plot succeeds, the doctor and Bill are consumed, right? You'd think that, right? Because that's like I like I say when we think about these evil plots succeeding, I like to think about the last thing that happens or close to it before that the final turn that the heroes win and it just doesn't work. So presumably, for whatever reason, the bugs are too quick. They consume the Doctor and Bill, and that would mean they the bugs just absorbed a Time Lord, which I think is a big. Yeah. X factor here, right? Because now she's got Time Lord energy, Eliza. Uh, so, what? How does that change things? So now, like, the, does does she become a, a true evil tyrant person that wants to take over the world or something? Or, or is it she, is is she suddenly revealed to be Jodie Whittaker? Oh, <laughs> a wooden Jodie Whittaker. A wooden Jodie Whittaker. Yeah. Which, how could you tell yeah. the difference? Oh, sorry. Hey, Didn't no, you? hey, no. Sorry, that's a joke, uh, Jody. No, no, no. No, 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 no. Better, better than the stone, all, almost as good as the stone Jody Whitaker in the, uh, in Flux. Um, oh, yeah. The, uh, the Weeping Angel version. That's a good one. Yeah, so that could be interesting. We could get a bit of a Dark Time Lord situation. Uh, Brian, what do you think? Yeah. Well, I get the idea that, like, uh, if the plan, if the evil plan would have succeeded, Eliza didn't have an evil plan. She wasn't actually part of that. So it would have been, mm. um, it would have been the son, David Suchet's mm. character sending the bugs after them and then her trying to control them and then them that not working. So maybe she has less control over that. And, uh, if he can control the bugs and he can control all of a sudden they have all the energy from a time Lord and he realizes there's something different with them that maybe, maybe he can do something to uh, advance his goals. And it's much more low stakes than, you know, a dark wooden time Lord, but his evil plan is that he just keeps his mother alive for the next 600 years. And the tragedy is that he's going to die before she does at that point. Yeah. Hmm. Yeah. That is the point. Like he's, he's not got any uh, time Lord energy himself. He's not going to regenerate. He's, on his last legs. Uh, and that's, and his evil plan is just to keep his mom alive. Well, yeah. could, could he not then get the bugs to turn himself into a wooden immortal th- thing mm-hmm. and then sort of be his, you know, mother son together forever in that sense or no. Yeah. So maybe, maybe that, that maybe the time Lord energy gives him enough power to, to turn wooden as well. Or maybe we just get a wooden Capaldi. Right where they he, <laughs> they can't they can't consume him entirely. They just turn him into a wooden thing, and then he's stuck there in the house. Yes, and then he he goes into a wooden TARDIS and uh, into the the old control room with its wooden panels, and uh, vows vengeance on the space lice. Mm. Um, yeah, or well, maybe we get uh, we get a wooden wooden valyard. Maybe we get one of these interstitial regenerations. Maybe they uh, convince the trees of the world to grow again, like they did in in Forest of the Night, <laughs> and then it's it's like Wood World, <laughs> you know, yeah. like it's basically that's how they end up taking over and turning Earth into some kind of wood empire. I don't know. Or maybe this is the beginnings of the Forest of Cheem. Yeah. Mm. Love it. Yes. Well, e- either way, we, we, you know, instant solution for climate change, uh, as we talked about in, in the forest of the night, like just grow enough trees, suck in enough CO2, and it's not an evil plot. It's actually fixing the planet. All right. You just got to get wood, I guess, for that to happen. <laughs> oh, but no. Oh, no. You knew I was Well, I guess, I guess we got through a whole hour of the episode without making a wood joke. So <laughs> it had to happen. It we have to, to move happen. on. Yes. That's, uh, that joke but, but is also, a signal we have to go move on. 
Yeah. Before yeah. we move on, we should say that who who or what uh, in the vault would would then not be released in the, in that uh, situation? Oh, evil. that's right. Yeah, which would kind of mess things up a little bit in an interesting way. Anyway, but we we won't we won't reveal. <laughs> yeah, we'll probably say we won't reveal uh, who or what that is. So anyway, time to move on. Time to move on to the third question. Where is the Clara Splinter? Clara Oswald, of course, splintered in time at the end of the name of the Doctor. She is somewhere in every single story. Where is she here in Knock Knock? Well, uh, she might be basically doing cleanup here on the fact that there's suddenly this large piece of real estate uh, with a bunch of trash on it. Um <laughs> You know, with people asking questions about, well, hey, who who owns this area now? Could mm. we maybe build some student housing on it with um, proper outlets? Yeah, exactly. Can we get the electricity up to code this time? Um, yeah, yeah, maybe less creaky floorboards. I, I don't, don't mind know. that. Uh, it's kind of mundane, yeah. but that's kind of the episode. So <laughs> that's kind of where we're at. Yeah, she's a real yeah. estate agent. Comes in, snaps it up. See, I was thinking she's like a neighbor to that castle place and she's she's the most not nosy neighbor in the world like she doesn't care that basically no one lives there and every 20 years a bunch of people move in and never, you never see them again and she just doesn't ask questions and uh just completely covers for it if she needs to uh conversely she might even be the incompetent investigator who's looked into each of these disappearances even though they've happened at the same house every 20 years and has not been able to put two and two together as to maybe maybe we should keep an eye on this this dude and see what he's doing in the tower there. Is that a good idea? And it's like, no, sure he's fine. He's on the up and up. It's all good. Moving on. Yeah, she might be like the the, the case officer assigned to the this this weird family situation. Yeah. And she's I mean, 72, right? So she's she's super old and just can't be bothered. Part <laughs> of the uh Part of the whole thing about Clara going into his timeline, he's not really in any mortal danger in this episode. She just has to keep putting him on the right path, right? So maybe mm. she was the the previous possible tenant who was like, no, this is a terrible idea. Like before Bill and, and her friends showed up just to make sure they got it so the doctor would be there. Mm. Yes, she's she's dissuading everyone else from renting it. She's nudging the landlord into the being in the right place at the right time. Yeah. Just to resolve all of this. Maybe she has a spare key and that's how the doctor gets in the first place because we do find him basically in the broom closet at one point. Uh yeah. no real explanation for how he's got in there. I like I like the explanation of her being dissuading everyone because actually it it, it makes sense now why this would come in the middle of the school year, it seems like, right? Because mm. I think the beginning of the season is more earlier, like that's more like September, and now we're like a few episodes in, you think, well, housing would have been pretty much resolved at this point, but maybe Clara yeah. for the last few weeks has been like, as soon as they're about to sign the lease, tap you on the street, actually, you don't want that because look at look at look into the past here and the groups of six kids have been leaving have been disappearing yeah. from this place for the past uh 70 years or so so don't do that and then she just like waits for this group she's like all right now we're good yeah 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 putting up flyers around the house uh warning people away from it um and uh, and then taking the flyers down just as uh, bill and her groom uh, her group come along all right yeah. flyer clara <laughs> um, good stuff. So we're going to have to move on now to the final question, the ultimate question, the only question that matters. Or not, not. What did we think of this story? So the pull to open rating system has five ratings. There is the Dalek, which we give to a good episode of Doctor Who. The Ogron, which we give to a not so good episode of Doctor Who. The Professor Hater which was an episode that may not be that great, but hey, at least they tried something. At least we learned something. Uh, the Viscount Banger, which we reserve for the best of the best. And the rarely used Fixed Point in Time, which of course is a rating that we give to episodes we simply cannot rate. It's beyond rating. It's something we give sometimes for reasons of nostalgia, but also for other reasons occasionally. 
Um, all right. So what do we think, guys? Um, Chris, why don't you go first, and we'll we'll save Brian's for well, last. I, you know, I think on initial viewing, I would have rated this an Ogron, and I think I'm actually going to upgrade it to to a low low level Dalek. Um, oh. I think it kind of. It set out its stall. It did what it intended to do. It's you know it is a kind of a mid episode of Doctor Who, as the kids say. Mm-hmm. Uh, but uh, it's very mid. But but also yeah, it's a, it's a Dalek. Like I I I don't think like with its limited ambition of like oh we're, okay we're going to do haunted house we're going to do space lice like it it kind of. You know, kind of met it. I think the 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 problems of Knock Knock are not necessarily the the problems of execution. I think they're it's just that it's kind of a you know mundane bottle episode in itself. But that's not a bad thing. You can't they can't all be Viscount bangers. Um, so yeah, I'm going to give it a, a a low low Dalek on the totem pole. Definitely not an Emperor or Supreme Dalek, uh, but a Dalek nonetheless. That's good. You know, you're kind of you, I. I think I convinced you last week to switch your rating from an Ogron to like a professor hater. Yes. You're kind of convincing me this week to change my professor hater to a Dalek. Uh, you uh, I'll have to talk hater. it out loud to know if I'm doing that or not. But I was thinking, I, I went into this commentary, this podcast thinking I'm going to give this a professor hater because I do have issues with how the story is resolved. I really do think bringing all the kids back at the end is, is a kind of a cop out. Um, and it, it robs the story of any weight that it could have had. So, um, but that said, you know, you're right that, Hey, not everything needs to be a weighty high protein meal, right? Like you can have Mm -hmm. a Tic Tac every now and then. And I would sort of regard this as kind of a Tic Tac. And I think what you said in the script, not really having the ambition in the first place Mm -hmm. to give you something weighty, I think you're right and it's okay and it's i'm okay. with you so you've done nicely, it you've convinced me nice, that yes. this is this is a good episode of doctor who it's not the most weighty episode of doctor who but you know what everything we talked about with bill the relationship with mm-hmm. the doctor all that fun haunted house stuff early on all that works and it it's probably a, doesn't go nicely, in the best direction for every fan but hey it's a nicely you know, self-aware everything. story, I think. Yeah. It's self-aware in many ways, uh, both in the sense that like, the kids kind of know that they're in a horror movie, right? Mm-hmm. They're, they're making constant references to it, uh, which I guess is kind of a thing in horror movies these days. Like, in Cabin in the Woods did that. And, well, it's know, all post-Scream, I feel like. Yeah. like once you get yeah. post-Scream, everything got meta. Layers of yeah. meta stacked on each other. So, yeah, yeah you kind of have like to do it. I did that. Uh, Brian, Brian, what do you think? I, you know, I'm I'm definitely in in Dalek territory. Maybe it's one of Winston Churchill's Daleks, um, <laughs> but it's um, David Suchet actually really makes this episode more than anything. Like the Bill stuff is great, um, Capaldi's work is great. The technical ability to actually create the creepy atmosphere um, was really was really good, but so much of that leans on David Suchet's performance, and then it feels like the entire script was built around the reveal and without his performance there, it wouldn't work. And it does Mm. so well. Um, And he, he sort of reverts very capably into a lost little boy. And Mm. that through line through all of it is actually what drew me most to it more than the horror, more than uh, the relationship between uh, the doctor and his companion. It was, it was his guest starring sort of, um, work mm. that was really the workhorse of this episode. But the other thing I really liked about it was the fact that it really stretches the 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 form of a Doctor Who episode, right? Like, this is the only show where you can have a hard sci-fi, a fantasy story, uh, a horror story, uh, a mundane story about the everyday, and then sometimes you can blend all of that. Right. And so it really, um, it kind of exemplified what a pretty average middle tier episode of Doctor Who can be. And that's not a bad thing. If you can get an average sort of Doctor Who episode, um, that's better than most things on TV. Nice. Yeah. You know, you don't really have the move in episode of the Mandalorian to my 
to my knowledge, should be able to do that. Hello. Maybe hey. maybe we could ha- have had that like the end of uh, season three when they get their new yeah uh, maybe you abode. <laughs> just see them walking in at the end when we iris out like just they're both carrying boxes. Well, John Favreau's yeah. a fan of the podcast, so I'm sure he's saying challenge accepted. <laughs> <laughs> love it oh uh, that's love awesome it. but no I, I, he's like okay okay Dan. what, what you were it. saying there brian i really like what you said about like only doctor who can really pull this off like all this combination of genres and, and sort of plot tropes and whatever like yeah that's yeah just, like, i the, think i think you've nailed like one of the reasons we love this show and you know there's we're one of the oh we're actually the only people podcasting about it i believe um <laughs> yeah. but yeah I think totally. I think that's a harder balance to strike than people watching the show. I mean, coming from a background of storytelling, hitting the tone correctly for one genre at a time is hard enough. Mm-hmm. Blend four of them and then have that that through line of tone work as well as it does in this episode is actually sort of a miracle that it turned out as well as it did. Uh, speaks very well of just what Doctor Who can do as. Uh, a medium for telling stories like this. Yeah. And, and Brian, I think you're absolutely right about David Suchet really making yeah. the episode. Uh, it re- you reminded me that my, my, my sister's kryptonite in any form of entertainment is old men crying. So <laughs> man, yeah, what she thought of this, because my goodness, he really, really sells that, you know, eyes full of tears thing at the end and in the reveal. It well, just we'll have beautiful, to. beautiful moment. I have to ask her in a future podcast because folks are <laughs> rapidly approaching the end of this one as we say goodbye to knock knock and enter the randomizer to find out where yes. we're going next the randomizer composed of two elements first of all is the codex or the list of doctor who stories in not random order or which peter's at the controls of and this is a the new upgraded codex uh which spits out immediately the number of Doctor Who stories that we have not been to. Uh, Pete, what is that number? A number, now that I am ticking off knock knock, is knock, at knock, knock, knock. 213. 213. Wow. <laughs> can I get mm. closer to that 200? I can taste it. Uh, and then the second component, the executor. Uh, is played by random.org, uh, which I guess Brian Young is going to man for us today, the uh, or crew for us, the uh, the actual random element, bespoke randomness, uh, randomness from the atmosphere, from atmospheric noise, from space lice bouncing around uh, up there in the in the stratosphere, uh, rather than algorithmic randomness, which computers are just terrible at guessing at random numbers. So, uh, Brian, if you would go to random.org and plug in the numbers one and 213, uh, and then don't, before, but don't hit the button. Yeah. Don't Hold hit the up. button yet. Cause we have don't some challenges. <laughs> we have challenges for the randomized. We like to, we like to tempt fate by <laughs> issuing, uh, requests, questions, desires, uh, and maybe even, uh, psychological tricks to, uh, you know, reverse psychologize the randomizer into going where we want. Uh, Pete, uh, what, what do you got from the randomizer this week? Well, before Brian takes us to our 101st uh, hey. podcast, um, I'm going to ask the randomizer uh, to give us a little more on family, because I think that mm. was a good theme at the end of this and the relationship between father and daughter. Um, you know, it's, it's definitely something that comes up. I mean, not in all storytelling, but certainly in Doctor Who. And uh, bring us to something that uh, shows us another dimension of family. Let's do that. Uh, we, well, uh, randomizer, we know the randomizer kind of like Susan. Uh, we, huh? We've gotten a lot of those early Hartnell episodes. So maybe, yeah. maybe this is it. Maybe this is the time that we get an unearthly child. Um, that could be that's an interesting suggestion i like that idea uh i'm gonna say let's showcase the uh the real uh the ability of doctor who to be many many things and not just horror let's go to a story that has no horror in it whatsoever no no hiding behind the sofa something more cerebral something different uh at least a different genre uh something that you know uh that the series rarely tries where it kind of stretched itself 
little bit. And uh, yeah, let's see what you can make of that randomizer. Nice. Um, um, Brian, uh, where, where would you like to send us? Uh, I'm going to, I think those are great suggestions. So I'm going to hit the button. Uh, let's do it. It's, I'll give you a countdown. Okay. Okay. You ready? All right. Yep. In four, three, two, one. Emergency temporal shift. Uh, 212. Whoa. Are you kidding me? Can you guess oh it, Chris? Oh my God. Oh my god, that, that, that means it's got to be Legend of the Sea Devils. Legend of the Sea Devils! <laughs> nice! All right, so, Look at that! Yes, wow. definitely a different genre. Uh, pirates. That's the pirates, right? It's pirates. The randomizer's been on a pirate kick, and, and Brian, you may not know this, but we have a, we have a curse on the podcast uh, since there was a point where uh, we were supposed to go to Curse of the Black Spot, and uh, we kind of misread the the number and uh, went to the Unquiet Dead instead. But but here that we're, we're one step closer, I think, to that curse being lifted by doing another pirate story and we've another Whitaker story, puns, another Whitaker story. We've done yeah. Smugglers, yeah. Uh, and and of course, this was uh, famous in, in Full Throttle Open History because I had not watched it for many <laughs> many many episodes, and it almost became a segment in itself, asking me if I had finally watched it. So. Almost. Here we go. It was, it was like <laughs> our most popular segment for that year. It's crazy. That's Christine <laughs> Legend of the Sea Devils. Oh, my goodness. Well, folks wow. are going to hear all about Legend of the Sea Devils in our next podcast. But, folks, before then, hey, why don't you go ahead and subscribe to this one if you haven't already? So go ahead and hit that follow button. Hit that subscribe button. Go ahead and leave a review. Share the podcast with a friend. You can also follow us on social at Pulta Open 63 on Twitter, on Instagram, on Facebook, or Pulta Open, all one word, on TikTok. Hey, Spotify listeners, we just rated Knock Knock. Now you can have your voice. Don't forget to rate Knock Knock in your app. You can call it a Dalek, Viscount Banger. You could call it an Ogron, whatever you like. We need more Ogron representation. No, not just saying. <laughs> but go ahead and do that. Um, hey, Brian, where can people find you online? Uh, just about anywhere on social media or, or wherever. If you look up Swank Motron, uh, that's where you can find me on Twitter. Uh, Blue Sky. Well, you can't find anybody on Twitter these days. Um, mm. Blue Sky, uh, Instagram, wherever. And it's swankmotron.com. And if you're interested in hearing me talk about Star Wars with uh, a similar level of passion, um, that would be fullofsith.com or you can listen to full of sith wherever you get podcasts awesome another great podcast to follow all right folks this has been great we will see you next time for legend of the sea devils thank you brian thank you Chris. Oh, thank you both talk yeah. soon see you guys on the high seas